So our uh, next talk is from Stefan Weintraub, from Mind, who will talk to us about scattering forms and the series of my representation. So thank you for inviting me to this conference. So I'm a little bit off topic because I won't speak about Feynman integrals. I will just speak about Feynman tree diagrams. But to be fair, instead of speaking about one diagram, I will speak about the sum of all diagrams which contribute to an amplitude for any number of external lags. So instead of considering basically really the sum of all Feynman diagrams, the game will be to rewrite this sum as a single formula at the expense of introducing an integral. So we are back to integrals. And then basically I will try to see basically how various pieces which exist in the literature fit nicely together. So that is basically work done with Alexander and Leonardo, and Leonardo is also here in the audience. So, and how is this? Okay. That's a little bit more detailed outline, basically. I will consider three examples of theories which a priori have nothing to do and I would like to show you that they are related basically in a very nice way and then basically I review basically a few of ingredients which is now standard technology and in the end basically we come basically to see basically uh, what is essentially the geometry of three amplitudes. So the three players are the DR joint scalar theory, young mouse theory and gravity. So let's start basically with the middle one, basically a young mouse theory. And as I said before, basically I will consider arbitrary number of external particles, so that will be denoted n in the following. So young mouse theory basically uh, it's given by a Lagrangian, and basically if we write down the tree amplitude, it obviously depends on the momentum of the external particles and basically on the polarization, the spin. And then there's a standard procedure that basically we can rewrite it as a linear combination where we take out explicitly the color factors, the SUN or UN color factors. They so always can be combined into traces and basically, basically the color matrices can appear in different order. So this defines a cyclic order and the coefficient of what multiplies this color structure we call a partial amplitude. So also sense this partial amplitude depends on some cyclic order, and basically it's just an order how you label 1 to n in a cyclic way. So basically the important message is basically our amplitude depends on the momentum, a cyclic order, and basically the spins of the particle. And we can calculate it from Feynman rules, so this is really a straightforward dumb way to do it. If we are basically in a cyclic ordered amplitude, we have a little bit simpler Feynman rules, so basically the Foucault vertex is a little bit simpler than usual. Uh, yeah, okay, so that's basically just the message. You can compute these things if you really want. Then the second player is the BR joint scalar theory. It's given by this Lagrange density. It's a scalar particle which basically lives in two gauge groups, let's say G and G tilde. So it has two gauge indices or two color indices. And then you can play the same game as a color decomposition. Uh, basically rewrite everything in traces of one gauge group and something else in traces of the other gauge group. So you now have two orders in these traces. So basically the original thing, it's a scalar theory, spin zero, so it does not depend on any spins, so just on the momentum. If you now do this double decomposition, it depends on two cyclic orders. And then basically, if you fix now these two cyclic orders, which graph contribute basically to this double order amplitude, basically it's this it's just the graph which you can bring to a flip, basically, into the corresponding other order. For instance, this is the order 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Now look at the red vertex here. If I exchange two lines at this vertex, I get to this graph. And now the cyclic order is 1, 4, 2, 3, 5. And basically, it will co contribute, basically, to the double cyclic order amplitude with this one order and the second order, that one. Yeah. And then basically the Feynman rules basically are rather simple. It's just a scalar theory, so rather trivial. 
And the last one is gravity, basically perturbative gravity, where you expand around flat Minkowski matrix. So basically, this is a Minkowski matrix. This is a small perturbation. Kappa is assumed to be small. And then basically, you sh just have the standard Einstein-Hilbert action. And basically, what you get here is an infinite tower uh, in your Lagrangian, if you order it by the fields of the graviton here, this H is a graviton field, because you get basically an infinite number here, basically from the square root of the determinant, and also from expanding basically uh, the scalar curvature. But again, you can treat it basically as a perturbative theory, and basically you get basically Feynman rules, basically you get something for the propagator. Now a graviton has spin two, you can describe a spin two as a product of to spin one polarization vector, something like that. You can work out expression for the vertices. I didn't write it down because they are rather long. And plus, in addition, you have five graviton vertices and so on. And obviously, the graviton amplitude depends on your momenta. And basically, let me write basically the spin two polarization tensors as a product of spin one polarization vectors. So I say I collect all the ones for basically the, the first entry in epsilon and the second entry in epsilon tilde. So basically it depends basically on two copies of spin one polarization vectors. So in principle, all the three theories I introduced here, you can be computed from Feynman diagrams. It's a little bit boring, it's tedious, it's a lot of work. So for the scalar theory, it's so feasible to write down a compact formula in this way here, but I didn't bother to do that for the other two theories. Now, let me review some recent developments. I would like to start with Jacobi-like relations. So what is this, basically? You know from a Lie algebra, SU3, SUN, UN, basically you have basically this rel Jacobi relation here. You can rewrite it in terms of structure constant, then it looks like that. Or you can rewrite it basically graphically, basically where you say each vertex is basically corresponds to a structure constant and repeated indices are summed over. Then you get basically these three diagrams and you see basically it's always the same diagram, it's just the labeling of the upper legs which is different and the Jacobi identity simply tells you that the sum of the three vanishes, which is basically exactly this equation here, the second one. Now, if you look at young Mills theory, basically, of course you have four clone vertices. You can always rewrite it in a way that you just have three valent vertices by just saying, insert the fake propagator here, basically p squared over p squared, which is one, and basically you can either do it in that way or either in that way, just to make sure that the sum gives the original vertex. There's some arbitrary way of splitting that thing, so it's not unique but you can rewrite it basically in terms of three vertices only. So basically you can rewrite your young mills amplitude as a sum of a graph, three valent graphs with three valent vertices only. So you get some denominators as in a scalar theory, and then you get some numerators. And you would get also some numerators from standard Feynman rules with just some arbitrary splitting of the Foucault vertex. Now, PCJ, from Bern Carrasco Johansen says you can choose there exist numerators basically whenever you have basically three graphs which look like that basically with a labeling like that that you can choose numerators which satisfies this Jacobi identity. They don't come out naturally from standard Feynman rules but they exist and you can solve for them basically with standard linear algebra tools. <coughs> if you have that basically you can do the following. If you have basically something like that and assume the Jacobi identity and anti-symmetry of three gluon vertices, which is always guaranteed, you basically can bring this graph down to a linear combination of those graphs. And if you do that repeatedly, basically, you can fix basically a line 1 and n and basically reduce any side branches, which are again trees just basically to this simple thing here. So these graphs here are called multiperipheral graphs. I think that's the name Victorio gave them. I will use basically here uh, the name comp graph for obvious reasons. 
No, basically, then double copy or color kinematics duality is a statement that once you brought your Young Mills amplitude in a form where this kinematic numerator satisfies Jacobi relations, you straightforwardly can calculate the graviton amplitude by just squaring that one and erasing the color factor. So this is basically just another copy of this uh, kinematic numerators. And of course, basically, you get the p-adjoint scalar amplitude by erasing the kinematic numerators and putting in another uh, color numerator there. And I should also mention that you can calculate this PCGA numerators also from an effective Lagrangian, which agrees with the standard Lagrangian, basically in the terms of which have two, three, and four fields but in addition has an infinite tower of more fields and basically this tower of more fields is a complicated zero due to color <coughs> but if you keep it basically and treat it as a formal expression you derive Feynman roots from it they generate then the PCJ numerators for you so let's come to the CHY formalism and let's come to integrals let's introduce some auxiliary space, which is basically you start from a Riemann sphere and mark endpoints on that, and then you mod out Möbius transformation. So that space is called the model space of a Riemann sphere with n marked points. It's known it's of dimension n minus 3 because you can use Möbius transformation to fix three points at any location you like, usually 0, 1, and infinity. Then, basically, label basically is the coordinates on that space by that, and basically each external particle gets a coordinate that, and then just consider this functions here, basically where basically here I have the momenta, and here this auxiliary coordinates that. And then basically call basically where these functions i, fi, basically are zero, call them the scattering equations. So you have n of them, basically, this i can be one to n, and you can convince yourself that only n minus 3 are independent. And basically, then the question is, given the external momenta, what values of that satisfy these conditions? Basically, we are interested in solutions of these scattering equations, not just if you have one solution and you move your transform then it's again a solution. It's, it's not interesting. Basically, we are interested in basically the number of solutions which are not related by Möbius transformation. This is a finite number, and it's n minus 3 factorial. We call them n minus 3 factorial inequivalent solutions. Then Cachasso, He, and Yuan, they found out basically that you can write basically these three amplitudes I talked about as basically integrals, contour integrals, which localize on the solutions of the scattering equations by it's always the same measure and then you have two factors one color factor and one polarization factor as we can call it and then it just depends if you have two color factors uh, two cyclic factors one cyclic factor one polarization factors or two then and then you either get the p joint scalar young mills or gravity now I mentioned basically these contour integrals here basically they localize on the solutions of the scattering equations. These scattering equations, they are rational functions in that you can equivalently basically write them as a polynomial system of equations. And then you can think about the ideal generated by this polynomial system and think about a global residue. And it turns out basically that all these contour integrals basically are just global residues. And that was shown by Young and collaborator Mutz. Now, the question is, what are these functions entering there? Basically, the first one, the cyclic factor, is rather simple. It's given here, basically. You have some cyclic order. You have your set variables. And then, basically, just the differences appear as they appear in the cyclic order. So this is a rather simple factor. The other one, the polarization factor, basically encodes the information about the polarizations and the helicities. Uh, there's one way to define it, and basically there is some freedom how to define it, because you can, if you have one definition, 
since it's a global residue, you can add to that basically anything you like which vanishes on the solution of the scattering equations. It still gives the correct answer. Okay? So let me just give you the original definition, which is basically due to a reduced pfaff here. So this is basically, you construct a certain matrix, 2n by 2n, basically, so that basically the uh, upper left part basically is just given more or less something like you've seen in the scattering equations. The lower right part basically, you replace basically the momentum by the polarization vectors, and basically the off diagonal part, you replace one momentum by uh, uh, one polarization vector. It's an antisymmetric matrix, and then you can basically calculate the Pfaffian for it, the Pfaffian vanishes, and then you say, okay, maybe I erase two basically lines and columns from basically the first part here and basically two lines here, and calculate then the Pfaffian. That's called the reduced Pfaffian, and then it's non zero. And you can show basically that this reduced Pfaffian basically is independent basically of what lines and columns you delete if you're on the solutions of the scattering equations, if your external momenta are onshore, which we assume they are, and if your polarizations are transverse, which we assume they are. Uh, one sentence about KLT relations, this is the oldest thing, basically, which relates the three amplitudes. And basically, first of all, you can count in young mill theory, basically, how many amplitudes are there. And basically, of course, there are n factorial external orderings, but they have to be cyclic invariants because they multiply the trace, so they're just n minus 1 factorial. Then you can use anti-symmetry of the vertices to you reduce them to n minus 2 factorial, and then the Jacobi relations reduce them to the n minus 3 factorials. So basically, you have basically the independent partial amplitudes are n minus 3 factorial. And you can do that basically for the p-adjoint scalar amplitudes. Basically, that your two basically um, uh, cyclic orderings runs basically about n minus three factorials. You fix three legs basically, and let the other n minus three basically run through all permutations, and that defines you a huge matrix of dimension n minus three factorial times n minus three factorial. This matrix is invertible, and then basically call the inverse of this matrix S. So, and that is basically what we now call the KLT matrix, and then basically you get the gravity amplitude. If you think about this young mills amplitude as a vector indexed by the cyclic ordering, multiplied from the left to this matrix S, defined on the previous transparencies, multiplied from the right with another vector with sigma tilde. For n equals 4, it's basically graphically the graviton amplitude is a product of the young mills amplitude divided by the PR joint scalar amplitude. And basically, if n is bigger than 4, then basically you should really read that as a matrix equation. So, now let me come to positive geometries and canonical forms. So that was, okay, first I have to say basically about, if I think about differential forms, basically, a multivariate case, so in more than one variable, and basically I would take out one variable and say, okay, when does it have a pole in this variable? It's basically, if I can write it in the following way, that basically I parameterize some hypersurface basically by the remaining uh, variables, and basically if I write it basically as d set over that times something which lives on just on the space of the hypersurface plus some term which does not have a pole in that, then I call basically the residue of this form basically is just this psi restricted to this hypersurface with that equals zero. And I can do that uh, iteratively, and that defines basically what a logarithmic singularity basically of such a differential form is. Now, canonical forms and positive geometries, they became popular in physics by this article by Nima Ahmed and collaborators, and they say basically, okay, let's define them recursively, Basically, if you're on a zero-dimensional variety, 
a canonical form is just a function, and this function should have the value plus or minus 1. Basically, canonical forms should only have singularities on the boundary of some space. The singularities should be logarithmic. And if you calculate the residue, basically, it's a, it's a differential form of dimension 1 less. It should be, again, the canonical form of a lower dimensional space. So basically, these are basically the axioms for positive geometries and canonical forms. And this is, was basically a little bit motivation for us to look basically into the CHY formalism. How can it be basically married with this statement about canonical forms here? And OK, that basically, the third motivation comes from a paper by Sebastian Misera who showed, basically, that the three amplitudes we discussed before can be written as twisted intersection numbers. Uh, so basically, we had these functions before. We can ask, basically, how do they transform under Möbius transformation? They transform with this weight. And then you can ask, basically, how does the measure transform? And then you find, basically, that this combination, measure times these functions, basically is invariant. So basically, you can really view them, basically, as n minus three dimensional forms, which are invariant under Möbius transformations. And then, OK, we've seen this definition of twisted intersection numbers already a few times. So if you basically have differential forms, you can assign to them basically a twisted intersection number defined by that thing here. And the twist is given basically by some connection. OK, I used here the, the name eta. Previously, it was always denoted by omega here. So the, only, the question is now basically, if we go to the CHY formalism, basically, what is our twist? What is our eta? What is our omega? And it's very simple. Basically, it's just basically this, the defining equations for the scattering equations times the differential in this respective variable. And then, basically, Sebastian Misero showed basically that three, these three amplitudes basically are just the twisted intersection numbers of basically forms, which are either have the cyclic order as information or the polarization of in as information. So now the question was for us basically, does this fit nicely with the idea of positive geometries and canonical forms? So that brings me basically to the last part, basically to the geometric interpretation of scattering amplitudes. And basically, so think about basically scattering amplitudes in these three series given as intersection number of two forms. One form encoding cyclic information, the other form encoding spin information. So basically we talk about two forms, one cyclic and one polarization. These forms basically are differential n minus three forms basically on the moduli space m n compactification of that thing. And basically, the amplitudes are intersection numbers, basically, of these two forms. That was shown by Sebastian Misera. Then, basically, to have a nice theory, we would like to have that basically the only singularities where these forms become singular are basically on the divisor, basically, compactification without basically the bulk. We would like to have that the singularities are logarithmic, and basically the residues of the singularities factorize into scattering forms of lower points. So our contribution to this subject was to show that basically these points are rather simple for the first one, the cyclic one. Our contribution was to show that points 3 and 4 also hold for a suitable definition for the second differential form, that you only have logarithmic singularities and they factorize. OK. Um, how does that work out? Basically, the first differential form is rather simple. You just take this Pock-Taylor factor, cyclic factor, and basically just take the measure 
uh, and minus 3. So I recall that the Taylor factor basically was that thing here. And then you basically go through all the steps, verify everything, basically go basically from the set coordinate basically to cross ratios, verify you only have simple poles in these coordinates, and everything works out there. So this is uh, basically more or less straightforward. The second part, you need also basically one which basically carries the information about the spins. Again, we write it basically as a function times basically a n minus 3 dimensional differential. And we cannot take basically the reduced Pfaffian for that. The reason is, if you work out what the reduced Pfaffian is, basically, and write it basically in the variable set, basically you discover basically double poles and higher poles in set. This is not what we want. Basically, we said basically explicitly, we really like to have basically differential forms which just have simple poles, just logarithmic singularities. So basically, the reduced Pfaffian does not have that. It's not a problem for the reduced Pfaffian or for the CHY formalism, because in the end, you just calculate basically the amplitude as a sum over residues on the solution of the scattering equations. The solutions of the scattering equations are a zero-dimensional sub-variety in this moduli space. This moduli space is n minus three-dimensional, so it's just you need the values for physics. You only need the values on certain points. What we are asking here is much more. Basically, we would like on the complete moduli space to have a nice behavior there. So, how do we do that? And basically. We already know that basically these things here basically have the nice properties, just logarithmic singularities. So we can use them as a basis and press them up basically with the correct thing that basically everything works out. So it turns out the way we have to press up these things is basically just exactly the BCJ numerators for this multiperipheral graphs. Okay, BCJ numerators we can calculate by other means. We can get some, and then basically we trust them up, and basically we do basically just need basically the cyclic factors where we fix two legs, and then permute over n minus two factorial permutations of the remaining legs. So basically, overall multiperipheral or overall com graphs, basically, and then basically the sum of it basically gives the polarization function. Okay. Then, of course, you have to verify that if you use this definition here, first of all, you get basically your physical amplitudes out of that. So you have to verify that on the solution of the scattering equations, it agrees with the reduced Pfaffian. You can show that it does. You would also like to have some additional properties. For instance, this polarization factor should not depend on any cyclic ordering or on any singling out any particular particles. Here in the definition I treated particle 1 and n, basically the ends of the comp of this multiperipheral graph, special. Right? These are special, all the others are treated equal. And you have to show basically that this definition is really invariant under the full permutation group. Again, you can do that. You can show it's invariant under any permutation of the external particles you can think of. So this is a good definition. And then basically all the other properties, basically uh, the logarithmic singularities are rather straightforward once you've shown that the cyclic factor has just logarithmic singularities. It does. And then you just have to verify that the residues are again basically exactly of this form just with lower points. Again, you can do that and it satisfies again C6. So basically, in principle, what that does, basically, it tells you, basically, you can think about the tree amplitudes given by two differential n minus 3 forms, which live on the moduli space M0n, which have really nice properties. Basically, the properties, they look a little bit mathematical, but I think they're really nice. And basically, just basically these two scattering forms, basically said they determine really the three theories. They are really linked together, basically. So it's just two scattering forms determine three different theories. 
Uh, I think I put some information here in this talk just to wrap up basically how, for instance, you can calculate the graviton amplitude. So, of course, the first most dumb way to do it is just to sum, sum over all Feynman graphs. But this is a tremendous cost for five, six, or seven gravitons, so nobody wants to do that. So the first efficient method basically is to use color kinematics duality. You first find out for young mill theory your BCJ numerators and then just square them and sum over all tree volume graphs. We've seen basically the CHY representation which boils down just to a global residue of these two functions here. We have the KLT relations if you know the young mills amplitude and basically the PR joint scalar amplitudes. You take the inverse matrix, multiply them together, you also get the graviton amplitude. And basically the last point I was talking about, the intersection number basically of a differential n minus 3 form with itself. So that brings me already to the conclusions. So I really like this geometric picture, uh, complete amplitude given basically by an intersection of n minus 3 forms. I really love that. But of course it brings, basically raises some question. I mean, we just have two differential n minus 3 forms that determine three theories. So the question is of obvious, is are these differential n minus 3 forms a little bit more fundamental than the three theories? You need, yeah. So, and of course, basically makes manifest basically the amplitude and does not expand it in Feynman diagrams, so it sums up all Feynman diagrams at once. Covid, of course, I was only talking about three level diagrams. Let me be clear about that. So it's not loop amplitudes here. So, but of course, we would like to know does this generalize to loop amplitudes? So let me finish, basically. If you're interested in the various topics I mentioned here, I put up some references here. And thank you for your attention. Okay, here. And, um, okay, I, I, I may remember how to calculate this uh, third line. Uh, if you talk about the, uh, the amplitude, I mean, of, uh, let's say, the, let's say, Berens Hiller recursion or something yeah. like that. Uh, I'm wondering uh, if you had some time, you or some student, to look at these uh, four lines and see what are the performance, what are the numbers you get from that. If you can actually calculate, let's say, put momentum and polarization and calculate things. For instance, also if you can prove with some of them um, easier, let's say, this uh, patent Taylor formula or things like uh, that. Let me first ask Rash, uh, back basically, are you asking about calculating the Young Mills amplitude or you're asking about, for instance, no, no, the gravity Mills, amplitude? Young Mills, Young Mills. For Young Mills amplitudes, the fastest way is, as you mentioned, basically parents gilly recursion relations. I mean, have you tried this intersection number? Is not. Uh, uh, of course, I, um, um, yes. I calculated some of these amplitudes symbolically in a computer algebra system in all four ways, yes. Uh, but if you really ask for speed, my advice is really offshore parents gilly recursion, recursion relations okay. for Young Mills amplitudes. And the second for gravity, yes. I don't want to write down all the Feynman rules, no? no it's okay. So I would basically maybe opt actually for the third line. Yeah. Uh, half question now. Uh, you talk about now this kind of theories. I mean, is there a kind of extension to other theories like fermions, massive particles, or whatever? Um, to some of the things, basically, uh, yes, we actually. Uh, also worked out basically what are uh, basic PCJ relations basically for things with massive quarks, massless quarks, yes. This can be worked out and actually Leonardo... Or for the intersection, then, which is the last one. For the intersection, we didn't do that. Uh, what
what you get basically we, you have to redefine a new form basically because if you want to have fermions it have spin one half basically so you cannot put it basically I mean you need something new here huh? this is clear uh, we didn't do that Um, so I have a more structural question for your gravitational scattering amplitude. So what it has some type of the features that uh, the individual terms in your intersection number representation of the gravitational scattering amplitude have? Like, does it have like sp spurious poles? For example, KLT, you know, in individual terms in KLT you have spurious poles. So I, I'm just trying to gauge of like, in comparison to that, what, what does this intersection number representation look like? If you write down something explicitly, for example, for like a five or six particle uh, gravitational amplitude. Um, so let's, let's say NM, NMHV amplitude split, hel split helicity. To give you an answer, basically, how do you calculate uh, the intersection number? You look up in the papers by Sebastian. Now, he says, basically, the best way to compute it, basically, if they only have logarithmic singularities, you get some from basically a clo uh, global residue uh, of the critical points. So if I would have to compute these intersection numbers, and since I have shown there exists a form which only have logarithmic singularities, I can use exactly this formula, and then it boils exactly down to the work of Yang Chang and Matsugat, who says, okay, I have to calculate a global residue. I can do that without knowing the roots, basically where the solutions of the uh, basically scattering equations are. I just need basically an H basis or a Krippner basis. So that's basically what is involved in computing the intersection numbers there. Then you plot that into the VCJ numerators that you got. The PCJ numerators are set independent. So I don't have to plug in anything there. Yes, yeah, so may I ask about uh, the status of the one loop slash y formalism? So you say this is an uh, intersection number computation. I suppose it's uh, this intersection number on this Riemann sphere, isn't it? Yes. Uh, if can you do this kind of similar thing for the torus and try to get the one loop slash y amplitude out? Uh, I didn't work on that subject. I think. Yvonne Gaia, uh, uh, Ricardo Montero, they have papers basically on the one loop generalization of these formulas. Not the intersection number, but in the CHY formalism. And then I think basically you can try basically further generalize what that would be in this intersection business. I believe this is probably possible. So everything here is in D dimensions. You don't specify the <coughs> on the polarization. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, is there a, a difference in the way that you calculate things if you restrict to four dimensions, where you see extra simplicity in the amplitudes appearing? <coughs> if you go through any of these uh, these approaches, right? So in the KLT, for example, if I fix the helicities, then I immediately see the compaction equation before I start constructing the gravity amplitudes. Do you see similar? It's basically, you get the same simplifications everywhere. Basically, for instance, you would, instead of having basically, uh, sorry, uh, symbolic polarization vectors, you would use spinor helicity method for the polarization vectors, which give you basically, if they're dotted into the reference vector, chosen or probably, they give simplifications. That occurs basically, I think, for everything here. It goes through. So there's, no, there's no, nothing particularly special. So there's nothing. No. It's basically, uh, in this talk, I really kept basically the polarization vectors. I never used basically spinor helicity for those. But you are, of, of course, if you're interested in four dimensions, you're absolutely free to use them. 
And basically, then you can choose a clever basis of polarization vectors to get all the sim simplifications you usually get. So I don't see any more questions, or we can continue discussions over the coffee break, unless you have, you have anything to add? The coffee break is in the same place we have this morning. So.